Okay, I'll get going then. Hello and welcome to the Critical Minerals Geology Workshop hosted by EGRU. I'm Helen McCoy-West and I joined James Cook University and EGRU earlier this year as an igneous petrologist and economic geologist to develop research in critical minerals. My main focus is the role of magmas in ore deposit formation and I'm currently working on the Mary Kathleen Magma Fertility Project in the Mount Isa area. Here at EGRU and JCU, we are also working on or developing future projects that are related to cobalt, rare earth elements and other critical minerals in the Mount Isa region and northeast Queensland. Firstly, I'd like to draw your attention to two EGRU professional development online courses that are coming up soon. The first of these is Strategic Planning for Mineral Exploration in a Changing World, and that's on the 10th and 11th of November. The other is Magmatic Hydrothermal Mineral Systems on the 2nd and 3rd of December. So if you're interested in more information or how to register for these, can you please contact Kayleen Kamuti at EGRO. So now into critical minerals. So critical minerals refers to important commodities that are considered essential for major economies, but may have issues that are affecting their supply. So these critical minerals are metals and non-metals that are used in new and emerging technologies and environmental responsibility driven products. The three most commonly identified groups as critical minerals and metals are the rare earth elements, platinum group metals and indium. Tungsten, germanium, cobalt, niobium, tantalum, gallium and antimony are also frequently identified as critical within the global community. Understanding the geological context of the occurrences of these commodities is crucial to the development of their extraction and processing. The increasing importance of critical minerals in our society is highlighted by the establishment of the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office this year by the Australian Government, as well as the recent Presidential Executive Order in the United States that highlights the need for secure critical mineral resources. Today we have three speakers joining us. The first is Professor Nigel Cook from the University of Adelaide. He has worked on the geology and mineralogy of sulphide mineral deposits and will be speaking to us about why detailed mineralogical characterization of critical mineral deposits is crucial. Our second speaker is Professor Gregor Borg. He is an economic geologist from Martin Luther University who has worked on Archean gold, base metal and rare earth element deposits. He will be speaking about European copper as a strategic metal in use, recycling, mining and exploration potential. Our third speaker this afternoon is Associate Professor Dan Smith from the University of Leicester and he has worked on various hydrothermal ore deposits and igneous systems with a more recent focus on tellurium and selenium. Today he'll be speaking about tellurium through the crust. And following our three talks we will have some time for questions and uh, discussion amongst the group. So I invite Nigel Cook to uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen and you're welcome to begin sharing your screen and prepare your presentation. Thank you very much, Helen. I'm just going to share the screen. Click on there. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Yes, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed for the introduction. Um, thank you to Yuan for the invitation to this. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing here at the University of Adelaide, uh, which is very much on the mineralogical side of, uh, of critical minerals. And I'll also try to tell you a little bit about um, some of the work that we hope to be doing in the future. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I have a you know, classical sort of geological, uh, geochemical, mineralogical background, but I'm actually now uh, in the Faculty of, of Engineering here at the University. And I'm looking a lot more at the, the process mineralogy on the process mineralogy side of things. Today, I'm sort of going to cover a variety of different things. It's, it could come across as sort of little sound bites, but uh, we'll just see how it goes. I wanted to talk just a little bit about critical mineral economics. What is criticality and what is real geological scarcity? And talk about process mineralogy and what I call recoverability. 
I then want to draw on some examples, first of all, from Indium, uh, one of the critical minerals that I've worked with a, a reasonable amount over the years. And secondly, also some, uh, about the rare earths. And thirdly, just very, very briefly on, on tellurium. I almost included cobalt, and then I thought, no, that's going to make this too long. And I'm going to try to draw some examples from South Australian iron oxide copper gold systems, such as Olympic Dam in here. Not because at the moment these are critical mineral uh, producers, but because there is considerable potential, uh, which we are starting to address in, in a number of research projects that are going on. But I'll try to conclude with some take home messages at the end. So critical minerals are this um, continuously evolving group of commodities of essential importance to contemporary society, as we've already heard, and or used in new green technologies and military applications, which are subject to concerns about sustainable supply um, against a growing demand. So research interest in a wide and evolving range of critical minerals has rapidly expanded in the last decade, uh, with really significant advances being made in understanding their geology, their mineralogy, and their geochemistry. Also, how, where, and why these commodities occur in nature, how they can be efficiently extracted, whether as primary or byproduct commodities, and also the economics of critical minerals production. And I think if anybody did a, did a study, they would find probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of papers being published, and that number is being increasing um, every year. It's hard to keep track of what's going on. So what are the critical minerals? Well, we've already heard a little bit about that. Many of them, of course, are not actually minerals, but they are elements, and most of them are metals, and some people preferring to talk about critical metals. The definitions of what is a critical mineral continues to evolve over time. I think that's very important. And also as supply and demand change, or as new elements are added. And different jurisdictions also have subtly different lists of critical minerals. The Australian list, the EU list, the Japanese list, and the, uh, the US list. Um, for the purposes of largely what I do, I try, try to use what um, the definition um, used by the US government, Department of the Interior, and that's a long list, a long list of actually 35 separate, mostly elements. There's a few minerals in there. The, the minerals are highlighted like bauxite, fluorspar, graphite, and potash. They've also got helium on this list as well, which is not something that most of us as, um, as earth scientists are actually looking at on a regular basis. All the others really are elements, and most of them are minerals, of course. Uh, uh, most of them are, are metals, of course, including the rare earth elements. A new EU document came out in September 2020, which um, proved quite interesting reading, I must say. And this was to get across the idea that these uh, critical minerals are evolving fairly rapidly at the moment. Uh, compared to the previous 2017 list, um, there were several additions, bauxite, lithium, titanium, and strontium. I'll talk a little bit about strontium in a, in a moment. But we also see under these uh, critical raw materials, things like silicon metal, uh, natural rubber, and coking coal as well. I think it's important to note here that elements like arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, which nobody really was looking at, was interested in a few years ago. And these were traditional penalty elements in copper processing. Um, now, all of a sudden, they're on the critical minerals lists being published around the world. That's interesting. And it's also important from a processing point of view, because we're actually trying, in many cases, to get rid of those penalty elements from our copper concentrates. Um, we've been making a fairly strong case for copper to be included as a critical mineral as well, because really when it comes to usage of different metals in some of the high-tech applications that are coming along, really copper is absolutely king. A, an electric battery electric vehicle is going to use more than four times as much copper as a, as a regular internal combustion engine vehicle, and demand for copper is, go, is predicted anyway to, uh, to increase at a fairly significant level due to this growing demand because of electrical vehicles. So there's a good case really for copper to be included as a critical mineral. We still need to have guaranteed supply to meet this rapidly expanding demand in the future. Some other economic um, considerations. The concentrations of critical minerals in the ground are, as with any commodity, really without value unless they can be recovered economically. And that's gonna be dependent upon many factors, including the mineralogy, and market forces, and many, many others as well. That's what I mean to say that we shouldn't get drunk with water every time we find some concentration of these elements of interest in the rocks and ores that we are looking at. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to be a mineral deposit. There's also a tendency, I think, in the recent literature to over, overstate perhaps the importance of critical minerals. And certainly the significance of PPM level concentrations of, for example, tellurium, antimony, rare earths, and many others has, in certainly some of the conversations that I've had, met with some skepticism or lack of interest from industry. We've got to be a little bit realistic in what it all actually means. We cannot really refer to any of the critical minerals that we find as an ore or as a resource unless they can be recovered economically. And that's dependent upon many factors of which mineralogy is of course one of the most important. When it comes to geological scarcity, with some exceptions, geological scarcity doesn't really make any of the commodities really and truly critical because many critical minerals are actually quite common, but unfortunately are only rarely sufficiently concentrated or in a suitable mineral form such as recovery is feasible. Many critical minerals seldom form ind independent minerals or are more commonly partitioned into common minerals such as oxides and sulfides and so on. There's some examples given there. And actually, when we look at the, the crustal abundance of some of the elements which are listed as critical, aluminium, magnesium, manganese, strontium, there it is again, uh, we've actually got uh, nine of the top 20 in terms of crustal abundance on our critical minerals list. So geological scarcity and criticality are two quite different things. Let's think about strontium for a minute, which has been added to the list uh, for the EU and is already on the, on the American list. And neither strontium is neither... Um, Neither strontium nor its main mineral, celestite, are particularly rare. So why is strontium listed as a critical mineral? Well, most natural celestite contains weight percent levels of barium. And celestite is a low cost commodity. There's not a heaps of money in it. And so it's very expensive to purify the, the raw celestite to remove the barium and calcium, making most celestite deposits that we know about actually uneconomic. There's only a few currently working across the world. And this is some, some laser ablation mapping uh, that uh, my colleagues have been, been working on recently, showing very nicely this oscillatory zoning of the barium and the calcium uh, in celestite grains. Another real feature of critical minerals is, of course, price volatility. You know, even though growing supply of some critical minerals may actually outstrip demand, leading to a considerable price volatility. We can see the graph on the left here, uh, showing essentially the, the massive drop in the lithium price once large supplies of lithium from brine production came on stream. It dropped the price. The market price is readily impacted by newer, uh, cheaper sources of supply, changes in usage patterns, stockpiling, recycling, the availability of substitute materials, actual or perceived risk is actually quite important, and many, many other factors. Another example there, cobalt. What has happened in cobalt over uh, over recent years. There was this massive boom, and then just as quickly, the bust. This idea of criticality, it's really a sub, uh, subjective concept, and if you want to read just two papers on what is criticality, I'd certainly recommend these two. Uh, this is really an excellent paper here, the, the Joe et al. paper in the uh, SEG special publication that came out last year. Uh, and there's also a shorter paper here published in Resource Policy, which I'd also recommend. Uh, which gives you a kind of a critical look at what is criticality, what makes these elements, these metals, these minerals worth adding to our list of critical resources. I'll finish this part of the lecture just with this one um, and just sort of remind ourselves that compared to global production of major metals like copper or zinc, we really are talking about pretty small volumes. Indium, just 760 tons a year. Even some of the rare earths in great demand. We're only in a few thousand tons. Tellurium there at 470 tons. So it doesn't take much in terms of supply to really upset the market and you know, potentially also lead to a volatility in the price. This was another interesting paper I thought that came out uh, last year, uh, which is really about the volatility on the metals market and the exposure uh, of uh, various critical minerals. If we look over here, we've got price volatility on the vertical axis and global production uh, on the horizontal axis. And many of our critical minerals really very small production and many of them also showing considerable price volatility as well. So if we are 
geologists, if we're exploring for critical minerals deposits and we have found a deposit which may or may not come into production many years hence, we can't really predict what the market is going to be like um, by the time we get there. So I, I prefer to sort of think in terms of recoverability. How easily can a given critical mineral actually be recovered? And we can see there's big differences, for example, between the lithium brines and the pegmatites. This is really less about grade or percentage recovery, but about opportunities to recover valuable minerals at minimal capex or, or running costs. This is why there has been such interest in low-grade rare earths or in gallium in soils and laterites, because they are easy to recover. They might not be particularly high grade, but they'd be relatively easy to recover. And also why existing operations looking at byproduct opportunities in the processing circuit is probably a better shot to go at than completely new resources out there, even though I think there's tremendous opportunities uh, for new, completely non-traditional sources of critical minerals. Very low-grade deposits out there, but ones with a mineralogy as such that they can be easily recovered. So to mineralogy itself, well, a comprehensive understanding of mineralogy, mineral compositions and deportments really is absolutely essential. And this doesn't only apply to process mineralogy, including how the dose deportments will change during the processing, but the feed mineralogy and the inherent geological variability on the deposit or prospect scale. Mineralogy is going to dictate the processing options even more so than for our more common minerals. And future, oppor future opportunities, but also it will tell us about the pitfalls, the variability, the presence of deleterious minerals and elements in there, another very important concept we will consider a little bit later. So much work has been done in the past decade to understand the likely hosts for most critical minerals in different deposit types. We know now, for example, that if we have an assemblage of chalcopyrite, sphalerite, and galena, we can be pretty sure in most geological environments into which of those three minerals, the different trace elements, including our critical minerals, are actually going to go. So we can uh, predict partitioning, which enables us to have a much more accurate prediction of deportments. And this was an example, I won't go into that in detail, but showing these three minerals, the indium, for example, sitting firmly in the sphalerite, the bismuth in the galena, uh, the, uh, the selenium also in the galena, for example. Nevertheless, some surprises do continue to turn up, and I'll show you one here. We, uh, <clears throat> my co-authors and I did some work on energite uh, not so long ago, and we showed that energite can display intricate compositional zoning and can actually sequester a surprising range of minor elements at quite significant concentrations, including germanium, tellurium, um, and even gold, it should say there, not tellurium, and even gold as well. There. That doesn't make energite a source uh, of ore, a, a, an ore mineral itself that we should uh, be seeking to separate and exploit, but it just goes to show that sometimes our, <clears throat> our concepts of how individual elements are, are, are distributed amongst different minerals we have to look holistically and even consider those that perhaps we wouldn't otherwise consider. Sticking with indium as an example here, well, independent indium minerals are, I think, as we all know, quite pretty rare, and they're only really found in deposits with a high indium to zinc ratio in which the indium is not easily retained in solid solution within the sphalerite. Then you start getting these beautiful simplex types of sphalerite and, and rochesite, uh, which is the copper indium sulfide as in those uh, illustrations I'm showing you there. More commonly, indium is found in sphalerite and it's also found in chalcopyrite. Um, and in more or less all the deposits I guess I've ever looked at, there's a rough ratio of about one to three in terms of concentration between the sphalerite and the chalcopyrite. The sphalerite is the main host, chalcopyrite the subordinate host, unless of course, you've actually got a lot more chalcopyrite in your deposit than sphalerite, in which case the chalcopyrite can actually be the major host of the Indian. Not uncommonly, that sphalerite is going to feature oscillatory zoning of indium and other minor elements. Um, individual spot concentrations can go from almost zero up to several weight percent. And it's very typical uh, in these grains to see variation over multiple uh, orders of magnitude as well. We know now, I think there's been enough studies done, that stanite is an excellent indium host. If you've got stanite present, that could be a, a main um, host mineral for the indium. We know that cassiterite is a poor host, and that galena pyrite, arsenic pyrite, and most other um, sulfide minerals are actually negligible hosts for India. It's really all about the sphalerite, chalcopyrite, and if you've got it, also the stanite as well. 
Now, this was some spectacular oscillatory zoning uh, from uh, Svelarite from, from Bolivia that we were looking at last year. So we can now map at various scales, and this is a, another example again from Bolivia, another piece of work here. Um, actually, this, we're looking here at the millimeter, almost a centimeter scale. But looking at this incredible variability medium that have a whole variety of other uh, trace elements in the Svelarite. Um, I'm going to draw on this piece of work here. This is from one of our, uh, the visitors we've had here in Adelaide, uh, looking at indium and looking at heterogeneity of sphalerite compositions at the grain scale, but really mirrored by heterogeneity across the entire deposit. Textual subtypes of sphalerite can have markedly different indium concentrations, and this could really make deposit scale deportment really hard to accurately model what's going on. And so to actually design a resource model based upon critical elements that have incredible variability at all scales can be very different, very, very difficult. The same study has also shown us that uh, some gang minerals can also contain significant amounts of indium and also gallium and also others as well that can really sometimes compromise resource estimates and recovery based upon limited sampling, limited assaying. Here we see scarred garnets, for example, uh, which are significantly enriched in the indium. It's not all in the sphalerite and the chalcopyrite. Substitution mechanisms for the indium are relatively well understood. I think also for gallium, antimony, and many other elements. We still have some uncertainties about germanium being incorporated in the sphalerite with enigmatic conflicting data suggesting both the 2 plus and 4 plus state, uh, possibly suggesting that there is some redox control going on. And there is still a lot of outstanding questions about the crystal structures and correlation uh, between the phase chemistry. Um, and, the, and the crystal structure as well. I won't go into that in detail here, but it's a very fertile field and something else we've also been, been working on quite a bit recently. I'll move on to rare earths now and say that you know, rare earth element mineralogy, I think is relatively well understood. Um, but what people often tend to forget, I think is that different minerals incorporate individual rare earth elements in quite different proportions uh, due to crystal structural constraints. And that therefore knowing the bulk concentration is X weight percent RE uh, rare earth oxide, or that a given min mineral species is dominant in a particular ore system, may be largely meaningless, or at least only very much part of the story. Here we've got some examples from Olympic Dam, uh, different rare earth minerals, and very different fractionation trends. The kind of fractionation trends you would expect based upon the crystal structures of those minerals. Clearly, we can see that xenotene, for example, that is the one that loves to. Uh, loves to host the more valuable heavy rare earths, even though in this particular deposit really it's besnesite and syncytite, which are uh, by far the, the most abundant of those rare earth minerals. So again, just saying we have, ah, you know, 0.4 RE203 in a deposit doesn't really tell you anything too much about whether that rare earth is ever going to be economically uh, viable to recover, because the distribution is for sure going to be a lot more complex. And anyway, what rare earths do you actually have? Uh, this is the, uh, <clears throat> uh, that, this is the, the rare earth resource of Olympic Dam, it's the red line there you can see on the right on that top, top diagram here. Sticking with the same theme, um, any deposit containing rare earth elements may show an evolutionary uh, parigenetic sequence. So different minerals incorporate individual rare earths in different proportions. At Olympic Dam, we see, for example, that the fluorocarbonates which are the dominant rare earth phase, bestnesite, syncytite, dominate over florencite, uh, which often replaces those earlier fluorocarbonates. The florencite is in turn replaced by calcium, strontium, rare earth, aluminium, sulf uh, sulfate, phosphates, uh, really a solid solution between woodhouseite and Svanbergite in there. And all of these different minerals have different rare earth patterns, indicating also that as one mineral replaces another, you get release recrystallization going on the deposit. We've got monazite in there as well in the mix and also xenotheme as I said. They're relatively minor but actually answering the simple question which of those species hosts the greater part of the more valuable heavy rare earths is a question that we have not yet addressed and will need to go into considerable more detail to actually get there. There's also variation in the composition of those rare earth minerals. Um, in Olympic Dam, for example, we have cerium, lanthanum, and neod neodymium dominant varieties present. So a lot of variability within the scale of the deposit. Uh, and also, if we want to go down to the nanoscale, um, the 
uh, some of the work that we've been doing show intensive disorder, uh, order disorder and polysomatism amongst the rare earth fluorocarbonates as well, which is jolly interesting. Uh, but just shows you how complicated some of these minerals can actually be. Uh, beyond that, we've also got rare earth, of course, in other more abundant minerals like uh, fluorapatite, uh, which is compositionally zoned with evolving rare earth uh, element fractionation patterns. So it's by no means uh, the same across the scale of the deposit. And there's a couple of, couple of papers been published about that as well. And um, also that any approach to understanding or quantifying the rare earth element deposit has to be holistic. So you've really got to look at all minerals uh, in the system. This was some nanosims mapping here uh, done of uh, grains of uh, apatite within, within pyrite. You can see we are, we are picking up the neodymium uh, and the, um, uh, the terbium there as well. But we're also picking up radium and thorium as well because apatite does also contain um, uranium and its daughter isotopes as well. And here we can see a, an image of, of xenotene overgrowing of zircon. Again, that's from a limited uh, from published work. So <clears throat> uh, continuing what I was saying before, you know, rare earths, and yttrium and scandium can also be found in other minerals ranging from fluorite to iron oxides and garnets. And this illustrates why we need to really look um, holistically at the overall picture of our assemblage. And although the concentrations are typically quite low, these gang minerals, if they are abundant enough, and sometimes they are, uh, can nevertheless account for a significant proportion of virtually non-recoverable rare earths in some ore systems. So a real awareness of the co-hosts or potential losses is thus extremely important if to do a proper evaluation of it. Uh, carrying on, there's also this issue about rare earths and uranium. Uh, rare earth element minerals often occur together with uranium minerals or other uranium uh, bearing species such as oxenite, for example, um, such as radioactivity may be an issue in some systems and our concentrates might be considerably, uh, considerably radioactive. Uh, and moreover, of course, that some rare earth minerals can actually incorporate uranium and thorium into their structures themselves like monazite and alanite. So the concentrates produced uh, could be radioactive and that obviously makes them difficult to transport and we'd have to remove that radioactivity through additional processing, all factors that need to be taken into consideration. Luckily, not all rare earth deposits do have uh, significant amounts of uranium in their daughters, but quite a few, quite a few do. We've also found um, that some of these, uh, these late rare earth element, calcium, strontium, aluminium, phosphate, sulfates are actually observed to contain little parent uranium, but these are readily able to sequester radium and the daughter uh, radionuclides. And you can see on these, these again, these are nanosims maps here. We're even picking up concentrations of lead 210, um, as well as the radium in there as well. These are incredibly good at soaking up mobilized radiogenic lead um, and radium, things at the uh, isotopes at the bottom of the uranium decay series into their structures. So again, a useful observation um, with implications for or, pro or processing and recoverability. This was a really nice paper that's just been published. I just wanted to mention this here as I really thought it was a great piece of work uh, showing the importance of process mineralogy in, in looking at rare earths, that the distribution of the, the different uh, rare earth minerals is very different uh, from the light rare earths and lengthen them at one end all the way down to the heavy rare earths at the other. And only by a really detailed study um, have they been able to actually understand what's going on in this particular carbonatite deposit and make some recommendations about how it should be processed. Again, stressing just the importance of, of mineralogy at every level. I'll just move briefly to, look to tellurium here, which is present in many sulfide ore deposits, as we know, and generally at low concentrations. It can be dispersed in the lattice, it can be as nanoparticles, it can be uh, within those common sulfides. Uh, but it can also be discrete telluride minerals. I could have found probably you know, 50, 100 uh, pictures of telluride minerals to show you here. I decided against it. Uh, so you've got gold telluride, silver tellurides, lead tellurides, bismuth tellurides, all the rest of it. And so I just have to move that there. Very few deposits, of course, in which tellurium is present at sufficiently high concentrations to recover directly. At Olympic Dam, for example, tellurium occurs as micron sized grains. Hesite, altiite, bismuth tellurides that occur within the copper iron sulfides and at concentrations of around about five, between five and 50 parts per million in the copper sulfide. These little tiny white grains you can see here 
uh, circled on the image are little grains of alzeite, for example. Increased demand for tellurium is linked to rapidly expanding applications in solar panels and as a semiconductor and or demand was doubled over the last 10 years and is predicted to rise threefold by 2050 um, as solar energy technology becomes more widely adopted. Uh, current global tellurium demands are met through recovery of tellurium from anode slimes during the electrolytic refinement of smelted copper. The fantastic thing, of course, is that almost all sulfide hosted tellurium, irrespective of whether it's discrete tellurium minerals, whether it's nanoparticles, or whether it's actually in the crystal lattice of our copper sulfides, is thus going to survive smelting and be present in the copper in the anode copper and can be recovered to those slimes during electro refining. This is actually a case where the mineralogy is not important as long as it is associated with, with those sulfides. So <clears throat> for tellurium, if we're going to recover from the NO slimes, the mineralogy doesn't matter. It's almost all tellurium, irrespective of its form, is going to report to those anode slimes. And these are some published numbers. Again, I use the example of Olympic Dam, where we've got around about 3.5% tellurium by mass in the anode slimes, and almost 15% uh, selenium in there as well. There has been extensive work done on the tellurium mineralogy, and I put those um, inverted commas around mineralogy because really this is, these are anthropogenic phases in the anode slimes, but they have shown uh, that there is considerable differences um, in, the, in, the, in the speciation of those things that from, uh, from one refinery to the next. Um, but I think a lot of exciting work can be done in this direction. I think more importantly, that it's important to say that you know, even if the demand for tellurium does increase threefold, fourfold, fivefold, this can probably be met by just more production from anode slimes from copper refineries. We don't need to necessarily go out there um, and mine deposits uh, which have uh, telluride minerals within it. We can meet that demand. My take home messages would be something like this, that detailed min mineralogy really is critical in any critical minerals is, is, is critical in any critical minerals project. Uh, quantitative modeling of deportment is absolutely crucial for efficient processing of critical metal bearing ores. Um, there's a great need for geologists and metallurgists to work together and break down discipline boundaries. That's something we've been very much doing um, in our group here. But approaches really have to be holistic and we shouldn't rely too much on assumptions. Some of them may actually be wrong and that there's still an awful lot to be learned about the geochemistry of some minor elements. The most obvious minerals or ores are not necessarily those which can be exploited most economically. But byproduct production using existing processing infrastructure may represent greater opportunities than completely new operations. For, as far as future predictions are concerned, the demand will undoubtedly rise Critical metals are likely to evolve. Some may disappear from the criticality list. Others may be added on. And the market price and real criticality are going to fluctuate significantly. It's very, very hard to say where this is all going to be in 2030. Concentrations of minor or trace elements do not necessarily translate into critical metal deposits. I think that's also an important point uh, to bear in mind here. So I'm just going to thank people who have I've been involved in some of this work over the years, particularly our uh, microscopy unit here at the University of Adelaide and the Institute with which I'm associated. I'd also like to thank Kathy Eric, particularly from uh, Olympic Dam. And I hope um, that very soon we'll be starting a very significant project with, uh, with BHP on critical minerals within that deposit. And I did just want to mention here that there could very well be uh, in early 2021, some PhD opportunities as well. So if anybody is thinking about doing a PhD and wants to go into this kind of area, not looking necessarily at critical minerals from a geological point of view, but more from a processing point of view, uh, please shoot me an email um, about that very soon. I think also Christiana has been in this work uh, and our PhD students and, uh, and particularly some of our overseas visitors, people like Jing and so on as well, who really have contributed to the things that I've shown this afternoon. I've added at the very end here um, some of our publications that I have cited in this, in this presentation if anybody wants more details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel, for that excellent overview of the critical minerals and the mineralogy. Uh, I think we've got time for one question. If anyone has a question they would like to ask. 
if I may. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Hi Helen. I'm going to talk at length afterwards. But uh, Nigel, good to see you. A question you, that I have, I, th I think uh, sort of number 10 or 12 from the rear was a slide just before tellurium where you showed some of your rare earth elements in carbonatites. And there was at the bottom left, there was sort of a very sort of hair like fibrous white SEM image where you could see the rare earth minerals included in some other phases. Oh yeah, but that's not, that's not our work. No, no, no. I'm not talking about whether no. it's your work or somebody no. else's. The general problem I'm, I'm addressing okay. is we, we, yeah. we, were, we were exploring a carbonatite yeah. in, in, the center, in the center of Germany. It's under, it's under 200 meters of glacial sediments and was very unknown. And one of the things that turned out that the recovery and the mechanical liberation of very, very friable rare earth element, uh, rare earth element minerals was actually what killed the economic yeah. project. Yeah. Because in the end, you're talking about sort of particles that are two microns diameter and 10 to 20 microns long. And in the end, it would have meant that everything had to be leached in bulk and the acid consumption basically kills it. So yeah. if anybody can come up sort of with any sort of liberation technique and separation techniques prior to leaching, that would make a big difference. I fully agree with you, and I've seen this in a, a lot of examples that really this very, very fine grade fibrous um, <coughs> carbonates are often like that. Uh, and that it, it is incredibly difficult to get a clean, uh, a clean concentrate. Um, and as you say, the acid consumption. In this case, I thought it was actually quite interesting, quite neat that they picked up that the, the bulk of the heavier areas are actually in the much coarser appetite rather than in those, those very fine. Good, good. There. Um, All right. Why well, I wanted to actually to show that as an example. Personally, I think, yeah, they would be able to, to get that appetite, but I think some of these very fine fibrous uh, fluorocarbonates are going to be extraordinarily difficult to do it economically anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. Would you like to start your presentation, please, Gregor? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm slightly distracted here because there's a beautiful sunrise outside. <laughs> so let's quickly get this started and let's go to the front of this. No, this is, sorry, oh. that is the last slide, which I didn't want to have on this one, but I'm not going to finish my talk. I'm going to start my talk. So we go to the front. Sorry for spoiling the last slide, but here we are. <clears throat> well, Nigel, thank you very much for setting the scene. Um, by giving sort of the, 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 the varying definitions of those minerals and elements that we're talking about. I will show you from old Europe, where people think everything is overexplored and over, over researched. I will show you an example, which sort of is trying to bridge the gap. Me as an exploration geologist and working a lot with the industry like you guys, coming from the social side, the use, the recycling side, right at the end to the open questions in research. And those open questions in research on a very common but critical and strategic metal like copper, showing what the research potential still is by sort of a changed understanding of the ore deposits of copper that we have in Central Europe. So there's a lot of photographs in here that basically show what span we are covering in this, um, <clears throat> in this subject of copper. Well, I mean, this is sort of trying to make a little bit of fun of what Nigel has pointed out, that there are numerous definitions of this. And to throw in one more word, although there are other terms on top of that, now you also read about critical materials. Now that could be sort of, it, it wouldn't have necessarily to do anything with mineralogy or geology or these. So there is a big variety and you can sort of add or subtract some of those. Politicians are very, very easy to impress as long as it's a, it's a mineral or element name that is difficult to, to pronounce. So prosodymium is loved by politicians because they normally haven't heard about that. Copper is far less spectacular. But what I'm going to show you is that copper is critical and sometimes even overlooked. I was glad to see that it was included in what you have here for your seminar on your list. 
<clears throat> um, what are the challenges? The challenges that we are facing with the new, with the future, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we need a number of new technologies. I'm sure there will be more which have not been identified or have not been invented, but to have sustainable new technologies, it's basically in the field of renewable energy. It is e-mobility and it's energy storage. So at the moment, those are the challenges that are most pressing for the future. And obviously, for to, to be able to achieve that, there are a number of metals, a number of elements. Some of those, Nigel has summarized them very, very nicely. And this is just a selection of few. It's the PGEs, platinum for, for the catalysts, obviously. It's cobalt, nickel, lithium for battery storage, and it is copper. And copper is an interesting one because it is huge volumes, or the mass is amazing, that is needed. It is easily available. Is it easily available? Can it be turned into a mine? And the problem also with copper is it is a huge volume, and the demand and consumption grow, and they grow exponentially, as I will show you in some details. And then we talk briefly about some of the obstacles. And these are just um, two diagrams, the upper one for lithium, the prediction of the uh, demand, and the one for copper. And uh, there is quite, and, and the gap that is painted by many people has to be closed. <coughs> Right, let's just have a couple of these impressive images. And until sort of two or three years ago, you had to have artists' illustrations of this. This can now be replaced by real installations, which is a success. It's a marvelous success. I mean, you see this wind farm at the top and you see in front, that's why I'm showing it, you see power storage facilities. This is basically com containerized battery packs. And at the bottom, you also see solar power, and it's not wind power at the top, but it's solar power. And again, energy storage is one of the real big challenges of the future. And what do we need for this from volume? Volume-wise, wise, it is copper. Now, <clears throat> if we're looking at energy, renewable energy, and there is a very interesting term, and that is the copper intensity of use. So if we look, at power generation and how much copper is used per megawatt. And this is a very, very sobering diagram. It shows you that all the ones that are now by Fridays for Future and, uh, um, and, and other groups at the moment pushed, obviously, and we have to go for those. It's offshore wind, it's oceanic, it's solar thermal, it's hydro, it's geothermal, and so on. And those are the ones that need significant more copper per megawatt produced. Um, <clears throat> I'm not judging on this, but have a look. Obviously, if you have a nuclear power plant, it runs for a long time. It has a limited sort of um, array of elements and, and resources they need to build it. There are obviously the nuclear risks and there is the storage problem, but in the comp uh, copper intensity of use, they are, at the moment, they are unbeatable. Let's have a look <clears throat> at e-mobility. So obviously there are plenty of um, new products on the market. There are hybrids, there are full electrical, there are hydrogen fuel cell ve vehicles. <clears throat> and all of them use, Nigel has already expressed this in lips, here it is in kilograms, but it basically shows the same, that there is a huge difference in the mass and the volume and the kilograms of copper produced per vehicle. And that is quite impressive. It makes a huge, it causes problems, as I will show you just now. And even when you talk about this, what is normally not included is the infrastructure. The, ch the charging infrastructure is more and more realized as the, the real problem. I mean, if you have an electrical car and you can charge it at home overnight, <clears throat> that's all fine. But if you travel, you need these chargers and they need a lot of metals to, to be installed. This is sort of, I've put this together just to, to play around with this. And if we look at the top row, there are copper bars just to illustrate this. And that is prior to electrification in the top, in the top line. Okay, so if we have a thousand vehicles and they're all with combustion engines, we would need 17, one seven tons of copper. 
Uh, if we take last year's example of electrification of e-mobility of vehicles like Norway, and in Europe, Norway is sort of the most advanced country, then we would need for those thousand vehicles, we would need an extra 3.2 tons of copper. And then you see if you convert all of these combustion vehicles to electric, full electrical vehicles, you see what demand in copper, additional demand in copper you would have. Now listening, I mean, things are changing at the moment, but if you would listen to politicians a little while ago, everything was rosy because one had told the politicians that you can have this circular economy and 100% of recycling. If you tell a, a politician 100% recycling, it's like full, full inclusive holiday travel. You don't have to worry about anything, but that is obviously a misjudgment of a staggering dimension. So this, and there are publications on this circular economy and they read very well. And there is sort of a, a bit of precaution when you look at Escher's beautiful illustrations on the left-hand side, that there's something possibly overlooked and it's not quite as easy as some people try to make us think. If we look at some of these, if we look at some of these, let me just sort of get the video images out of this, that's fine. Okay, now I'm see what I'm showing. This is a diagram that is dated basically 2010. I have redrawn it, that is why the curve ends in the lower right-hand corner apparently. But this is annual copper production since 1900 and copper production and consumption are more or less equivalent because industry has been able to supply what was needed. Now, if you go on and you show in there, first of all, the annual <clears throat> global copper production up to 2018, um, then, and hang on, that is in 2010 still, yeah, but, but uh, to 18, then first of all, you see that the curve has steepened. It has steepened significantly. And what we see in there is already the increased consumption and production from conversion to renewable energies. It's not the conversion to e-mobility yet. So you could say this increase in the steepening of the curve is quite a success story, but the copper has to come from there somewhere. And what I've put in, in green here is the typical 30 year life cycle of copper. Now you can argue whether the life cycle of copper, it depends for various elements on their use, but for copper, one can argue it's 30 years or 25 years. Just imagine any copper cable that you put into the wall of a building, when is it gonna be demolished? So the average sort of lifetime cycle of copper is around about 30 years. That means even in an ideal world where we don't have any recycling losses, where we actually can grab 100% of the copper that was put into the walls 30 years ago, we only can grasp and retain and then recover what was used and produced 30 years ago, and that gives a huge gap. That means for 2010, we have a recycling gap of 61% or 11 million tons of copper metal, and that has to be filled by primary mining primary copper mining, if we like it or not. These are facts that we show. Okay, sorry, there was a hiccup of the two slides. This was actually the increase from 2010 to 2018. It's easier to see. And this was the story to explain the recycling gap. Now, if we project this from 2018 to 2030, and each of you is welcome to do this. We do a little bit of crystal balling, but it's relatively easy to project what's going to happen because there's the conversion to e-mobility on top. On this, I've, I have done some modeling. It would even steepen more if most of the fleet of combustion vehicles, combustion engine vehicles would be converted to electrical. That means we have a huge gap. And if we look at the situation in 2020, for example, we would have a widened gap of seven of more than 70% um, to be filled. That means we need in 2025 at least an additional 22.5 million ton of copper, of copper metal that has to come from new exploration and new mining. 
So these are facts and this is not so much opinion and it has to be calculated for our estimations of future use. Now, well, it is easy to understand that obviously there are sort of lots of people that are not happy with misconduct, with sort of devastating areas, with leaving sort of ruined landscapes that is out of the question. And there is a lot of opposition to mining now also, or now mainly in the, what is called the new worlds. And uh, how is the situation in the old world, in, in Europe? And that's one of the things I want to look at. On top of that, and it has been understood, and I'm very happy that it has been understood, that one needs a social license to operate. Uh, so one of the most important things for the future will be the trust of all well, stakeholders. Uh, and there are some very interesting publications on this, what has to change that, in, that one right from the beginning has to take in the people that are affected and not only the one that profit from mining. What also has happened over the last years, and this is a diagram from, from 1985 to 2020, is the typical period that is between the discovery and the production of a deposit. First of all, I mean, the rule of thumb is only 2% of all newly discovered um, mineralizations or deposits actually turn into a mine. 2%. That means 98% are basically write-offs where only money has been burned. But it also means because decision-making has become so much more laborious, takes so much longer. That means we basically have gone from five years to 20 years lead time. That means one basically has to urgently explore and identify new resources to have new mines producing the needed copper for our sustainable future technologies. Now, let's go to a map of Europe. And in Europe, we've got one of the biggest copper belts of this planet, and that is a black shale sediment hosted copper deposit, the European Kupfersiefer. So this is Permian, Middle Permian um, sediment hosted copper which for decades had very oversimplified genetic models. It was syngenetic models. They, they, pers they persisted in Europe at a time when the structural controls and, um, and, and epigenetic processes were understood in Australia and Canada and the United States. But in Germany and Poland, which is where most of where all of the mineralization actually is, these sort of slightly outdated con um, concepts remained. They remained stubbornly. And what I'm showing here is not only with a lot of closed mines symbols on the southern border of what is, what, is, what is called the Permian Basin. This was a sort of a very shallow marine to, to lagoonal um, flooded desert basin which became stagnant and euxinic and one, but only one of the host rocks is a very, very organic carbon rich black shale. It can contain up to 15, 1,5% organic matter in various forms, in bitumen. It's, it's an absolute bitch to process and, and it's quite, quite difficult to extract the metals from unless you put it in a smelter and that is energy wise, not the most advisable. And you see in Poland some of these big mines, and I'll show you the size when, I, when we look at some of the tonnages and grades just now. But what I'm also showing in here, in orange and in red, are some recent and not so recent exploration targets, which um, are, some of them are catching attention at the moment, and like the ones in Poland, and also the one on the border between Germany and Poland. But there are other ones that are still waiting to be re-evaluated. Let's look at some of the tonnages in grade. This is for Poland and we are underground here in one of the Polish mines. Interestingly enough, the copper is not mined from the black shale or only in this outcrop only 5%, but most of the ore is in the underlying sandstone. And what we have here in the North Sudetic Trough is another 100 million tons of ore containing 1.5 million tons, roughly 5.5 million tons 
of copper metal plus silver plus many, many, many other byproduct elements, most of which are on the list of critical metals that uh, Nigel has actually shown. And if we go across this uh, big anticlinal and horse structure to the pre sudetic monocline, then we're talking about amazing reserves. And you see that it says it's, it's larger than because it is basically open-ended to depth. And if you sum up all of this, then we're talking about more than 2.8 billion tons of ore, billion tons of ore. Uh, with 55 million tons of contained copper metal. So we're talking about a supergiant. If we go to Germany, the resources have been mined out to a larger extent, but there are two areas, for example, Sangerhausen, where you got 34 um, million tons of ore with some close to 900,000 tons of contained copper metal. Well, they're basically more than proven reserves. How can there be more than proven reserves? It is a fully developed mine underground, which had to close at the end of the GDR when the GDR um, ended to exist because uh, and, and these operations were completely uneconomical. They had with all subcontractors 25,000 people working on this and obviously with 2% copper, this is unsustainable. Former East Germany had to mine these and to sell them to the West because they needed the forex. But the bigger area is close, I've shown that as a square close to the German-Polish border, and that is at spremberg weiswasser There we're talking about roughly 100 million tons of ore. It's indicated reserve and one and a half million tons of copper metal contained. So we are talking about substantial, and this is not taking into account the smaller prospective areas that still exist. Coming back to the genetic models, as I said, for a long time it had been published and published and published again that these were synth sedimentary deposits that sort of persisted from the 1950s in some areas until today. If you read some of last year's extended abstracts from, um, from SGA's conference in Glasgow, you find some amazing, there is some phrasing in some of the extended abstracts where the diagrams are similar to the top right one, showing exactly that you've got cross-cut, cross-cutting ore bodies. And the text that the author, a very established author, writes next to it shows that he still grasps and hangs on to the synth sedimentary model. So it's interesting that we have a research potential in this area and, a, and an exploration potential from a changed understanding of concepts. And that is what I find so interesting of what has not been researched. And I mean, what you don't see in these diagrams here in these profiles is a single fault. And I mean, for Australians, for Canadians, for Americans, it doesn't come as a surprise if I, surprise if I tell you it's structurally controlled. Right, let's have a look at rocks. Let's have a look at ores. Well, on the right hand side, you can see a mixture of fracture hosted and carbonate replacement ore. And this is way above, this can be up to 35 meters above the organic black shale. At the bottom right, you see a sandstone and a sandstone in which some of the sandstone has been replaced. So you've got very crazy fluids, which are hardly researched. And you see this, this bornite chalcosite uh, replacement in a sandstone, obviously from fractures in the football sandstone. This can be down to 60 meters below the black shale. One of my favorite samples, actually, I'm the owner of this one. It has been hardly, very, very rarely described. This is a, a very nice hand specimen where you see a tiny bit of the laminated black organic carbon rich shale at the top, and you see the underlying conglomerate. And in this conglomerate, you can see it on the hand specimen scale, but better on the microscopic scale, you see the replacement of lithic clasts. So all the feldspar of this lithic class has been replaced by chalcopyrite and chalcosite. That's quite amazing and certainly not a synth sedimentary origin. If we're looking at the German portion, because again, this has not even been studied or published um, um, on the Polish side, we see here a map in for, and you, you, you see the distribution map for copper, lead and zinc, and you see an overlay of major lineament structures 
and of certain zones in the underlying basement. This is by Vedapol and Renz. Vedapol was fantastic for very early global geochemistry publications. His five volumes are sort of typical textbooks. He also published a little bit on the sin sedimentary origin of the Kupferschiefer and Johannes Rentsch. Now the same authors that show this beautiful control of the lineaments and so on, fail to grasp and don't point out that this actually shows and documents and proves a structural control. Isn't that amazing? And very, very limited structural studies of this mineralization has been done so far. So it is an amazing sort of opportunity to address some of these subjects here, especially on the Polish side with modern structural studies. So is Europe underexplored and not fully exploited yet? Well, I don't think so. So these are three of these, the, these areas that we've got here. Let me just quickly go on. Yes, here we are. So now we have all these detailed maps in here. And the example that I mentioned where you have proven reserves actually with a flooded, with a flooded uh, um, mine uh, installations with the edits and shafts and so on is the one at Sangerhausen. It's got this roughly 35 million tons at 2% copper equivalent and sort of you see the mining depth, it is sort of the maximum depth is 700 meters below surface. So if we go to Spremberg Weisswasser, which is on the border between Germany and Poland, you see this area here and surprise, surprise, this is from work that was done roughly eight or ten years ago all of a sudden structure creeps into the maps. It is very, very strongly structurally controlled. It is an anticlinal structure which has been chopped up afterwards. And the top levels is at 800 meters below surface. So we're talking about relatively deep mining, but we're talking about roughly 100 million tons um, of ore at approximately 2% copper equivalent. My, you've got sort of mineralized width of the succession can be as high as 10 to 15 to 20 meters. And on the right hand side, you see probably the most advanced project area, and that is uh, Novi Sol in Poland. Novi Sol, Novi Sol is um, relatively deep. That means we're talking about deep mining. It's more than 1700 meters below surface and um, sort of the delineated, inferred and indicated uh, resource at the moment is a minimum of 11 million tons. It's still very varying copper grades. So I hope I could show you if we concentrate on one element and relatively common one where people normally don't think it makes any problems, that there are potential problems of supply for the future. That if we look at old Europe, it's surprising on the research side and on the exploration and mining side of what hasn't been enough tested and investigated. And I think it also shows that it's worth to go to old mining district, districts um, and not least what I'm put in at the little inset at the bottom here. There are so many strategic byproducts. Socialist East Germany was pretty isolated from the West and they needed forex and to in order to obtain forex, they were trying to recover each and every byproduct regardless of the economic costs. So what Nigel has pointed out, the economic viability, which normally is so important, didn't, didn't count in, in, in Socialist East Germany. And if one goes into the publications, it is amazing to see in a way that is very sustainable, although energy wise, this was a disaster because you need a lot of energy to recover all of this. But I think what was, what was recovered and used and sold were up to 35 elements from the Kupferschiefer. And that I think brings me to the end. And now I finally show the picture that I showed at the beginning because it means we have to stay curious. We have to stay curious, remain curious to keep exploring because it is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and your insight into copper in Europe. I think uh, we'll move straight on to our final speaker today, which is Dan Smith. If you can prepare your presentation, please. 
me just uh, share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Thumbs up. Uh, brilliant. So I'm going to be um, focusing on on uh, one of the elements that um, Nigel talked about, uh, which is uh, tellurium. Um, and this is part of a um, a, a large project we did in the UK, funded by the uh, UK's uh, uh, Natural Environmental Research Council, which was a series of uh, projects that ran that were focused on metals that were critical for energy technologies. Um, some big consortiums with um, lots of engagement with industrial partners uh, and lots of communications with people. Um, uh, and, and, and that's the, the scale of projects that we, we need to tackle some of these problems. We need to be speaking to a range of companies and, and stakeholders. The, the, uh, the critical metals are, 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 have become critical for a variety of reasons. And uh, as Nigel's uh, talked about in his talk, um, some of it is, is, is not simply the geology or the mineralogy. Some of it's the, the metallurgy, the process mineralogy. Some of it's the economics too. Um, and one of the things that um, I'm going to try and do in this talk is, is, is share some general lessons learned um, about where um, the barriers are to um, the future of metal supply for some of these metals. And it's not always going to be resolved by finding new deposits. Um, but obviously, as a, as a geologist with an interest in exploration, that's obviously the most important step. There are other useful steps, too. Um, so very briefly, um, our project focused on uh, selenium and uh, tellurium. Um, uh, for those not familiar, they're, 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 they're in the same part of the periodic table as sulfur, and they have some very similar behavior. And um, the reason why we focused on, on both the elements uh, in the project, but I'm, I'm probably not going to do that very much in this talk, um, is that quite often they're considered uh, birds of a feather. Uh, by analysts. Um, they're recovered by very much the same process, so reprocessing of anode slimes, uh, waste from copper refineries. Um, they are often um, deployed in very similar technologies, so both have end uses in solar, uh, albeit in a different design of solar panel, uh, and, and often um, uh, the organizations that collate global statistics on mineral or metal production tend to group them together. So the USGS often consider tellurium and selenium and publish stats on them uh, in, in shared documentation. So it's become kind of lodged in the mentality of, of, of critical metals uh, scholars that, that, that the two are, are quite similar. Um, uh, I could show you this diagram for both metals. It would be much the same. This just shows the conventional production of, of tellurium. Uh, and, and, and shows you where the losses really are. Uh, and the losses are particularly acute early on, um, so during the concentration steps. Most of our mining companies that process copper ore will obviously seek to concentrate the copper minerals, um, and there, are, there will be other minerals that they will exclude. There, there are some spoilers here. Um, that mineral is probably pyrite, um, which is uh, by, by mass fraction one of the most abundant sulfides, and will often be screened out. Um, so it's not going all the way to a smelter as something that's not particularly carrying the copper credits, but by, by its simple abundance might be carrying a significant amount of the tellurium credits. But we have capacity in this production system. Nigel said in his talk two to three times, that's, um, I would agree with that in terms of the work that we've done and the people that we've spoken to. So we could potentially treble our production of tellurium if we wanted to without opening new mines or developing any particularly new technology, we could do it through efficiency gains and uh, perhaps some incremental innovation in, in anode slime processing. If we look at the anode slimes, they are um, uh, complex substances, uh, mineralogically very complex, um, and there's a lot of amorphous phases in there too, so a lot of minerals that as geologists we probably wouldn't recognize. In terms of the elements that are in them, copper, is obviously a, 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 an abundant metal, um, uh, as they are an output or a waste residue from copper refining. Um, lead can be important, selenium is uh, a significant part of it. Tellurium is not particularly abundant, owing to its crustal abundance, um, but it is there. But when we look at the value contributions of the metals that are within anode slimes, we get a different story and we start to see exactly why people process anode slimes. And the answer is it's 
for the precious metals. They uh, contribute uh, in most cases, or in almost all cases, 90% of the value uh, of an anode slime to a reprocessor it comes from gold and silver, and then a, a, perhaps an aliquot from uh, all the precious metals, such as the platinum group. Um, and the reason tellurium and selenium are recovered from these is that in terms of the mineral phases which occur in those anode slimes, they tend to bond with the precious metals. So the uh, tellurium and selenium outputs from this process are essentially waste outputs from the reprocessing of a waste. That's a pretty fragile existence for future supply, and it doesn't bode well for um, us as academics or, or even policymakers encouraging um, uh, the waste processes to, to treble their output. So what's happened over a long period of time is that actually the efficiency or the intensity with which we recover tellurium from copper has, has decreased remarkably. Uh, and in recent decades, the USGS has, has taken to withholding large parts of its data um, because um, there are so few companies involved in tellurium production and consumption within the US that essentially they can't protect the commercial interests by publishing uh, when they publish data. Uh, essentially, you can figure out which company is producing and which one's consuming from the data. Um, one of the other factors that's driven this is again on the process mineralogy side. So harking back to Nigel's talk and, and perhaps to link to Gregor's talk too. Um, heap leaching has uh, taken off uh, since the uh, mid 20th century as a, a means and mechanism of uh, cheaply producing copper from low grade ore in particular and that means of production has uh, essentially no um, potential for recovering tellurium at any stage. Um, so uh, our new mines that we might expect to meet our copper demand in the next uh, 20 to 30 years will probably have less potential to uh, resolve any uh, shortfalls we have in tellurium. Other reasons that it's critical beyond those economic and technical factors, it's a very uh, rare element, so um, we should consider it to be as rare as gold. It's significantly less uh, valuable, um, so its value is about uh, $70 per kilogram rather than $70,000 per kilogram in the case of gold. Um, uh, mostly um, it has industrial purposes, it has no application as a precious metal. Um, in fact, if you were to fashion jewellery out of tellurium, uh, you would absorb it through your skin and then excrete it uh, as body odour reminiscent of rotting garlic. So it's never really taken off in the engagement and wedding ring markets. Um, uh, selenium a little bit more abundant, okay, but very low abundance in the crust. Um, uh, I've, I've removed some slides for brevity, but um, just quickly, that, that abundance in its crust actually causes us some problems in understanding the geoscience. Uh, tellurium is a, is a strange part of the periodic table in that its mineralogy is actually pretty well described. There are a lot of minerals, um, uh, mineral hosts for tellurium that have been uh, nicely characterized and described, um, but there's a very poor whole rock catalogue. So um, there's a very scant range of data on just how much is in common uh, geological lithologies. Um, and, and our project didn't set out to rectify that and it, and it still remains a bit of a millstone around our neck. We don't know uh, with any, any real confidence how much we can say is in a, an average andesite, for example. Uh, and I suspect some of the other critical metals, when we peer back through the databases and the compilations of average crustal abundances, we'll find they're based on actually pretty poor data sets. Um, one of the reasons that um, uh, certainly the Leicester part of our project uh, doubled our efforts on tellurium and, 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 and rather uh, moved away from selenium is partially because they, they do behave very differently. Despite us grouping them on the periodic table and in publications and in production data, uh, tellurium is quite a different beast. Selenium behaves very similarly to sulfides and in a lot of the systems that we looked at and studied, it, it was essentially a... a, a, a um, a trace element in, in all the sulfide minerals, whereas tellurium has quite different behavior. Um, it's got a different electronegativity, different ionic radius. It has behavior that can make it a cation as well as an anion. Uh, and so it has a very different behavior in the mineralogy and in a, a number of the geological processes uh, that we are interested in as, as economic geologists, geochemists, petrologists, and uh, hydrothermal chemists. 
So it's crustal abundance uh, based on some of the compilations is in the order of uh, the tens of PPB. Uh, MORB, uh, the best data we've seen on it averages about five PPB, uh, but these are pretty poor data sets. So we work in rather uh, in the dark on, on some of this data. So in our project across the various universities that were involved, we looked at a range of ore deposit types. We weren't really interested in cataloging barren crustal rocks. And that's a little bit of an Achilles heel for us. That is data that I think we would benefit from longer term. Um, you'll notice there's a lot of uh, sedimentary type systems on their black shale, coal, uh, uh, red bed, sandstone, roll front deposits. Those are pretty important for the selenium, um, which is, uh, shows some uh, pretty interesting behavior at, um, uh, in, in critical zone, low temperature type processes, diagenesis as well. Um, but what, we, what I'm going to focus on for this talk is that crustal cycle of essentially a mantle to surface flux through magmatism and volcanism and uh, in the top few kilometers of the Earth's uh, crust, uh, hydrothermal activity too, and how tellurium behaves through that. What we really are trying to do is to establish what the um, prospectivity might be for different deposits if, if we cannot encourage anode slime reprocessors to uh, produce more tellurium. Can we, can we find other deposits that are worthwhile uh, uh, processing and exploiting for that tellurium contents? Um, so one of the issues we have is that um, uh, the reason why tellurium is not well catalogued in geological fasces is it's, it's pretty difficult to analyze at the, at the levels that we see. Uh, Multi-acid digests tend to drive it off up the, uh, up the uh, fume covered chimney. Um, so we're left with some gaps. So this is one of our colleagues that actually worked with us on the tellurium project and you will you will notice for those of you that are quick readers that tellurium doesn't make the cut um, because we just couldn't analyze enough of it in the, in the glasses that we used in particular for this study. Um, but based on the behavior of copper, silver, uh, gold and selenium, we expect that um, actually very little tellurium leaves the mantle to make it into the crust other than in areas with high degrees of partial melting, potentially facilitated, facilitated by fluids. So in other words, one of our best vehicles for extracting um, uh, tellurium out of the mantle and into the crust is in areas of uh, essentially abundant magmatism and volcanism. Its behavior um, when it's in silicate systems is uh, generally chalcophile or, or, or a chalcogen, if you like, it replaces uh, sulfur. Um, but it's not particularly compatible in sulfide minerals. So while it will partition into a sulfide rather than a silicate, as soon as those sulfides uh, start to um, crystallize, uh, tellurium essentially becomes an incompatible element again. So it's got a very strange behavior. It's chalcophilic or chalcogenic, but only for part of its life uh, through the crust. So liquids, sulfide liquids are important for the history of tellurium, but sulfide solids uh, far less so. So what we see, and, and this is reflected actually for, for, for those of you that look at the mineralogy of uh, high temperature ore deposits, such as copper nickel PGE deposits, where uh, tellurium can be an important uh, part of that, is that we, uh, our model for these, um, and this is work done by Holwell and McDonald um, uh, a few years back now, um, is that we see uh, an, an initial emissible sulfide melt that unmixes from the original uh, magma, uh, silicate rich magma, probably at high temperatures. So this is in a, in a relatively dry condition we're talking now. Um, and uh, ultimately that will separate out into uh, MSS. Uh, and then alter, as we continue down temperature that will separate into MSS and ISS. Um, and at each step, the um, tellurium portion is concentrated into the residual liquid. Um, and to the point where when we get down to very low temperatures, so realistically, um, probably around about 400 degrees, a tellurium is persistent as a, as a melt. But that melt fraction will be tiny. Bear in mind, we're talking about concentrations in the original silicate liquid that are probably on the orders of uh, parts per billion. So we're not talking about a mobile uh, melt fraction. And um, uh, Nigel has, has, has been... Um, uh, 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 productive in this field in the past and recognized 
um, that um, uh, gold, uh, uh, gold, tellurium, silver, bismuth and others have quite low eutectic temperatures in some of these systems to the point where actually you can have um, uh, melts of these semi-metals that persist down to hydrothermal uh, temperature ranges. But the question is, is whether they are mobile uh, when there's such a low mass fraction. And they're probably not in the, in the magmatic systems. So we do see associations of tellurium with bismuth and precious metals, the metals that we would uh, traditionally consider to be quite noble metals, so gold uh, and also platinum and palladium. But those associations are at a micro scale. If we were to pulverize a, a kilo or a ton of rock, we would see tellurium's association would be with a suite of uh, chalcophile and highly compatible elements, so nickel and copper included. So any mobility of semi-metal melts is, is presumably low in, in these silicate systems. Um, we don't have a good evidence record of this from arc magmas, from hydrous arc magmas. This would be a very deep crustal process, so quite undersampled, um, but we presume the same process as a car. So um, we have a lower crustal trap for tellurium. Not very much of it uh, would leave the mantle based on its devalue and its partitioning between any sulfides that persist in the mantle and um, the silicate liquid for, during partial melting. And we've got a scanty catalogue here, so um, take what I say with a pinch of salt, but it shows that it, overall its behaviour through the crust and certainly at the high and mafic end of magmatism is that it behaves compatibly during differentiation. So tellurium is trapped somewhere in the lower crust. Although it might be mobile as a melt down to low temperatures, it's, 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 it's incompatible in the silicate melt fraction, which is the really mobile part of it. Uh, and probably the mass fraction of the tellurium bismuth and other semi-metals is, is too low to really be mobile. So it's extracted like other uh, sulfide compatible phases, less so than nickel, cobalt and iridium. Those with a really high devalue and compatibility in early sulfides such as MSS. Uh, and a little bit less compatible than platinum and palladium, similar to gold and copper. Um, so the systems that seem to cheat this are um, in tectonic settings where we agitate the crust. Um, we disrupt the crust or we disrupt the lithosphere. Um, we see a really strong association of uh, tellurium enrichment uh, recognized through the telluride deposits rather than a, a bulk analysis of the silicate assemblage, I should say here. We see telluride, uh, a, a remarkable correlation with uh, telluride bearing ore deposits and, and, and telluride bearing prospects in areas of uh, what we would call post subduction magmatism. So it's areas that have had repeated bouts of magmatic activity, and in particular, they've seen extension after a period of subduction and uh, uh, compression related uh, magmatic activity. And what we think is happening is that the uh, tellurides uh, and the tellurium bearing sulfides that are, that are trapped in the lower crust during the normal compatible behavior, that differentiation of the sulfides at high temperatures in early stages of magmatism, they're essentially reworked and recycled by uh, later melts and perhaps remelting of uh, lithospheric uh, uh, roots rather than mantle roots or asthenospheric mantle roots during that extension. So um, I've got some data that, that I can't include in this talk. It's, it's a PhD thesis that's just about to be completed, it, perhaps next week, um, where we've got some amazing hafnium isotope data from uh, Romania that shows that um, the neogene magmatism in Romania um, more than likely came from the crust or, or at least uh, middle lithosphere um, uh, rather than uh, the contemporary mantle. So we're potentially recycling parts of our cumulate pile uh, and certainly our, our, our lithosphere uh, to, to reactivate that tellurium that gets left behind in early magnetism. So perhaps uh, our, our critical metals tell us a little bit more about our geological processes too. They're not just for the economic geologists. When we get to um, our fluids in our systems and this particularly we draw on, on, on systems that are in post subduction terrains now essentially they have sufficient tellurium that is moving through those systems to be visible in the ore deposits um, we see some strange behavior so this is work that Katie McFall did on the Scurias deposit uh, in uh, uh, Greece 
and she recognized that there are PGMs in, a, in, in what is normally a, a copper gold porphyry system uh, and they tend to be associated with uh, tellurides or, or tend to be associated with tellurium as telluride minerals. And her interpretation of this is that we see something that's been recognized in other deposits as the liquid bismuth collector model. So we have hydrothermal fluids that might have a melt of bismuth and precious metals that are co-transported at temperatures between perhaps 350 and 550. And we're starting to see the same processes uh, with uh, tellurium too. So perhaps the coexistence of an aqueous fluid and, and, and a semi-metal melt rather than a silicate melt in these cases. Um, when we look at normal porphyries and Andean type porphyry, we don't see those processes. That's probably because our telluride concentrations or bulk tellurium concentrations are too low. That lower crust, crustal trap really takes out a lot of the uh, mass flux from mantle to crust. Aqueous fluids are actually pretty poor movers of tellurium, uh, certainly at, at, at 300 degrees C. Um, volatile phase or the vapor phase is a more significant uh, a source of transport. So this is work that uh, was done by uh, Pascal Grundler and Joel Brugger, among others. Uh, um, uh, and, and what we can see is that gas phase transport of tellurium is, is, is potentially quite significant in porphyry to epithermal transition, porphyry to epithermal systems. Um, uh, perhaps um, uh, it gives us some reasons why our high sulfidation deposits tend to show uh, more tellurides than our low sulfidation type deposits. And basically, our, our low temperature gold deposits, in most cases, are actually going to be pretty poor sites to look in for more tellurium. In the deposits, such as epithermal deposits and porphyry deposits, one of the things that we did uh, look into is exactly uh, uh, where tellurium might be hosted. Uh, and, and certainly for many of these deposits, they, um, they don't have telluride minerals, certainly not enough to account for the uh, masses that we see or the concentrations that we see in whole rock analysis. Um, the tellurium is in many of these deposits actually hosted in the pyrite. Um, so for a deposit like a carlin type deposit which can have appreciable amounts of, um, uh, so that, that would be the gold, uh, the gold diamonds on here, and um, that can have a significant amount of tellurium. Uh, and obviously the pyrite is, 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 is the ore mineral of choice in those deposits and processed for the gold. So that can be really um, important to recognize is where we have a tellurium concentration in a mineral that we are specifically targeting. In a porphyry deposit, for uh, the most part, um, you would expect the metallurgists and the process mineralogists to be trying to exclude pyrite from the processing circuits that make it through to the uh, smelter and refinery wherever possible. And in particular, the pyrites that would carry significant amounts of tellurium are the pyrites that mineral processors would want to avoid. The association of tellurium in pyrite is largely driven by the abundance or concentration of arsenic in the pyrite. Essentially, arsenic unlocks the lattice for larger uh, metals and, and trace elements to substitute in. So we, this is recognized in, in a number of studies that we see this, this wedge-shaped zone of trace element concentration when plotted versus arsenic. It's a noisy plot, um, uh, but there's, there's, there's something in this that when we see very high arsenic pyrites, we see uh, much more exotic trace element chemistries. But these are not the things that we want to process. Uh, ideally, we would uh, probably uh, not be um, roasting and smelting arsenic, mercury, lead and thallium rich pyrites. Uh, and more broadly speaking, we, we, we see a crude overlap between whole rock, uh, tellurium, selenium contents and, and, and the, that contained pyrites. By simple virtue of the mass fraction of pyrites in the ores and the ore assemblage, it's, it's one of the most, in, most important controls on tellurium and selenium, even though it contains relatively little in and of itself. So, and it's that association, just harking back to one of my earlier slides, which means actually a significant amount of tellurium in, in ore deposits is, is probably never characterized uh, and is probably lost uh, on mine site to tailings. Um, so we, we're left with quite a difficult system to try and enhance tellurium recovery, certainly by targeting novel deposits. So the deposits that have shown some potential for, for being uh, remarkably enriched in tellurium are the uh, subclass of epithermal deposits. So I've already talked about how um, uh, 
uh, tellurium is, is poorly transported in aqueous fluids. Um, but it seems that there are some deposits which uh, break those rules that cheat the system and are much more capable of transport. Um, and they tend to be hosted in alkaline rocks. Most of our epithermal deposits on a TAS plot would plot in, in, in basaltic andesite through to dacite. In, in, in normal arc magmatic or, or rift associated silica saturated rocks. And then there are a small number of, of some of the world's largest deposits. So Vatakula in Fiji, Lahir and Porgera in Papua New Guinea, Cripple Creek in the USA. These are world-class gold deposits, phenomenal grade and particularly phenomenal tonnage of gold and silver, uh, but also of tellurium. And they're all alkaline. They're silica undersaturated alkaline rocks. Just to show you the size of these deposits, these are, these are among the, the, the top 10 uh, of, of, of epithermal deposits. So they're not curiosities, they are targets if you're a gold explorer. Uh, just some photos, just so it's not all uh, graphs and uh, uh, Excel slides. Uh, Crip Creek, so you can see the scale of this mine. It's operated for near as damn it 100 years, if not longer now, uh, and is now mostly processed through heat leach. Um, I think I'll be correct in saying it's never recovered any tellurium on a commercial scale and at the minute there is uh, little capacity to do so. So most of the ore is processed through cyanidation in uh, heat leach pads which are quite considerable uh, and, and, and tellurides and tellurium are insoluble in a cyanide solution. In fact the recovery of gold is uh, negatively impacted by the presence of, of tellurides and tellurium. It passivates cyanidation circuits. So Vatakula, which uh, it used to be referred to as the, the emperor deposit in Fiji, they did historically produce um, uh, uh, tellurium for about seven years in the 70s into the early 80s. Um, but now don't, they roast their ore prior to cyanidation. So the tellurium is, is all lost as a gas phase during that process. Um, is essentially vented out. So these deposits have uh, telluride contents. They're recognized telluride minerals, petsite, hesite, calaverite, uh, so gold, silver tellurides, but also uh, minerals like coloradoite, mercury tellurides, lead tellurides, um, and, and almost none of them process to recover the tellurium. In fact, they in introduce processing steps that allow them to drive off the tellurium so they can use uh, cyanidation. One of the things that we were interested in in our research project is understanding why this small handful of alkaline deposits might have these tellurium enrichments, given that aqueous fluids are so poor at moving tellurium around. And what we wanted to look at was a simple question, do alkaline rocks change the pH of a fluid? And because the pH of a fluid is, is critical to the uh, ability uh, to transport tellurium. And it sounds like a dumb question, but actually uh, it, it, it's not really been answered in the literature until we did our uh, study. So what we did is we took uh, essentially a volcanic gas, condensed it in water at 300 degrees C. This is all done by geochemical modeling. Uh, we reacted that water, which was now acidic through the addition of SO2 and CO2 with a series of rock compositions. We essentially titrated the rock into the water. So we start off with the very acidic fluids and we end up with something that's uh, hopefully neutralized by the addition of rock. So we go from on the left hand side of the plots acidic conditions that would be equivalent to a fluid buffered system or a high sulfidation system to the right hand side as you look at it which would be uh, 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 something that's dominated uh, by the rock composition and would be equivalent to a low sulfidation type or, 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 or um, Agillaria sericite type epithermal deposit. Um, so for those of you that are, your bellies are rumbling, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm showing you pictures of spaghetti, but just to show you the, the, the mineralogy, the key thing to look at these is the top line. Um, so in a normal andesite, dacite or basalt, so relatively agnostic of composition, quartz is the most abundant hydrothermal mineral that we see out of those rocks. In all stages of alteration, irrespective of the acidity of the fluids, until we get to ridiculously low pH, so sort of pH zero. Um, and that would tally with what we recognize uh, from the field as geologists, quartz veining and silicification are common features in hydrothermal ore deposits, if not the most characteristic feature of those deposits. When we shift to uh, a Cripple Creek type host rock, so in this case a phonolite, so it's the most extreme 
uh, extreme alkaline composition of the, of the deposits that I've shown you. Uh, what happens is when we get to our rock buffered compositions, uh, our quartz disappears. Essentially, it's replaced with uh, a, a feldspar and feldspathoid assemblage uh, at the propolitic um, conditions. Um, so we would see an absence uh, of, of intense silicification. We wouldn't see widespread silicification and, and silica sw um, uh, swarming in the rocks. We might see reduced amounts of quartz veins, not, not zero quartz veins, but uh, less. And certainly in the periphery of the deposit and the wider volume of altered rock. And that actually tallies pretty nicely with what we see uh, from Cripple Creek. Most of the rock there is, is still is still phonolite, uh, it's not been intensely solidified at all. There are areas of quartz veins, but it tends to be where we see contacts with the country rock, granites and gneisses that the phonolite diatreme uh, uh, was then placed into. Uh, and we also see uh, the other minerals that are, that are captured up there, including uh, some of the um, epidotes and uh, feldspathoids and, and some of the zeolites that are characteristic of these slightly higher pHs. We still have questions for ourselves as to how many of those are the original magmatic phases versus how many hydrothermal, um, and that's something that we uh, continue to work on. But the consequences of this mineral buffering is that the, the uh, abundance of quartz is really important for setting the fluid chemistry. And most of the time, these are not things that we have to worry about because quartz in our silica is so abundant. Um, most, our, most of our hydrothermal systems, once they hit 300 degrees or 350 and below, um, when they're rock buffered, they reach what's called a propolytic buffer. And we uh, have fluids which would be um, uh, essentially buffered at neutral pH. So our hot springs famous in New Zealand uh, are, are what we would call near neutral chloride flu fluid compositions. That's what's controlled by a silica saturated fluid assemblage. If we were to instead push those fluids through a silica undersaturated rock, we exhaust that buffer and we move on to ever more exotic buffers using feldspars, analcyme, acmite, uh, etc. And that means our pH uh, doesn't follow the same buffers. So what we see in alkaline rocks is an alkaline pH, um, but it's not to do with its position on a TAS plot in terms of sodium potassium. So it's not the alkalinity of the rocks per se, it's the silica saturation index of the rocks. Um, so what we, what we see is this incredible potential for some of these fluids to hit pHs, which are really quite alien to us in terms of the mineral assemblages that we look at. And what this means is that it moves us from most of the rocks that we would find in an arc setting, our classic coasts for epithermal gold deposits, really sit at the nadir, the absolute bottom of tellurium transport capacity. So around about pH 5.5 to 6, that's our classic 300 degrees C pH for a rock buffered assemblage. Almost no capacity for moving around tellurium and hence almost no capacity for tellurium enrichment in those deposits. If you can't move it, you can't concentrate it. What we see when we get to Cripple Creek, Vatacoola and other such deposits is this potential to have fluids that are pH 8 and orders of magnitude more effective tellurium transport. And if you can move it, you can precipitate it and you can dump it out by processes like boiling, for example, uh, and really quite uh, remarkably concentrated. So it's in these deposits that we see spectacular minerals like this. So on the bottom right, I would love to own this mineral, but uh, we were just shown it from a geologist's private stash. This is from Vatacoola. This is uh, sylvite, uh, sylvanite, silver gold telluride. You can also see in there, there's a beautiful little uh, perfect calcite rhomb. So in these deposits, or certainly in Vatacoola, what we see is co-precipitation of tellurides and carbonates. So high pH, not carbonate, uh, not tellurides and gold plus quartz. The top image is uh, uh, calaverite, pyrite, fluorite uh, on, on the surface of a, 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 a phonolite. So this is in a breccia infill in a vug uh, from Cripple Creek. So spectacular capacity for telluride, tellurium and gold transport and precipitation, but only in those alkaline rocks. That's wonderful, okay? But those deposits are all processed by uh, cyanidation uh, and uh, the telluride minerals don't respond to that very well at all. So what we've been working on in our project, and this is my last but one slide, I'm not gonna go into any great detail on this, is we have to work on the process mineralogy. 
we have to work out better ways of recovering these minerals. It's not enough to simply identify the geology, the, the mineral systems approach. It's not enough to identify the tectonic setting or the geochemistry. That doesn't resolve it as a, as a technical or an engineering or an economic issue. So we've been working with colleagues in chemistry to work on solvents, which will uh, dissolve tellurides and allow us to recover gold and tellurium without uh, dismissing them as waste. So we've been working on deep eutectic solvents. So these are essentially two salts that we mix together to get a liquid. Uh, anhydrous, uh, high salinity or a, a high um, uh, uh, ligand concentration. So we use uh, choline chloride and urea as one of our most common bases for dissolving gold and tellurium. Uh, and we can add uh, catalysts into that, such as iodine, to reduce and oxidize uh, the minerals. Cyanide free and no roasting required. Uh, and we, we, we're good in a big scale for dissolving some of these minerals and recovering uh, metals, at least starting to recover some of them through the electrochemistry. But it's innovation like this that, that we will need um, because we have to make these processes cheap. If they're not cheap, we won't do them as society. And um, uh, we need cheap supplies of metals in order for our energy to be cheap. Otherwise, we will resort to the next cheapest technology, which will inevitably be gas or coal. So real problems in how we uh, resolve our energy supply and, and, and geology is not always the answer. We're part of the, part of the answer, but we can't work in just our, our geology bubble. And just to, just to put this into an economic context, there is only one place in the world that has a tellurium reserve where they've bothered to drill and analyze during exploration stages, that's Kankberg in Sweden. And you can see on a plot of gold versus tellurium, it's really quite at the tellurium rich end of deposits. There's a whole cluster of analyses on here. The gray ones up in the top right are the anode slimes, by the way. So you can see that Kankberg is equivalent to the anode slimes in terms of tellurium versus gold content. This is based on last year's prices. Gold price has gone up during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So this plot has actually <laughs> deteriorated. You can see that um, for somewhere, um, um, apologies, that's clipped onto the, the green frame. So it's a little bit invisible. You can see that the, the value that the mining company, uh, New Belieden would get from the Kankberg deposit from the tellurium is not really gonna be their motivating factor. It's always gonna be the gold that drives it. So um, one of the things that we have been trying to work on is, is, is the way of a method of recovering the gold um, uh, better than we could with cyanide and the tellurium at the same time. Um, and we think that's the future for some of these critical metals is that we need to facilitate and enhance byproduct recovery. Um, targeting the critical metal, metals as the flagship, it just doesn't make economic sense in most of these cases, unless there is significant policy put in place that essentially uh, subsidizes their extraction and processing. Economics are always gonna be in favor of the, the major metals, the ones that we already mine and process for. Um, I'm going to leave it there. There's, there's a little summary text up there, but I, I, I've already spoken for long enough and I'll hand it back to, to Helen. Uh, thank you very much.